So it's, it's absolutely lovely being here today. Um, despite what Mike just said, you're going to now transition to a dry science talk. <laughs> um, but I'll do my best um, to kind of show you a little bit, a few examples of how we have started thinking differently about doing research and understanding um, autism and other neurodevelopmental disorders. So you saw Jaden, and for those of you uh, who don't know somebody with autism, uh, Mike made the point that if you see one person with autism, you have seen one person with autism, and different people with autism have quite different and varying characteristics. So I just want to give you a very, very quick primer for those of you who are not familiar, so that you can follow me a little bit later on in um, our efforts to understand this difference. So if you, if you truly uh, look at criteria and textbooks on definitions of autism, they will say that what makes somebody have autism is deficits or difficulties with social interaction and repetitive behaviors. But uh, for those of us who see kids with autism or have kids with autism in our lives, we know that almost never do we find a kid who just has difficulties with social interaction and repetitive behaviors. In other words, we never find, almost never find, a kid who only has autism. In fact, we know that kids and youth who have autism have other types of differences and sometimes difficulties um, that go from anxiety to irritability and aggression to ADHD-like symptoms to physical differences like differences in sleep and differences in their gut function, differences in their immune systems, higher chance of getting seizures, and so on. So at some point, we're starting to wonder whether this label of autism actually means anything. So if this autism doesn't exist on its own in our kids, in our youth, in our adults uh, with uh, ASD, is it a distinct biological category? Now, why are we obsessing with this biological category business? The reason we need to understand the biological variation, the variability in biology, is because if we develop effective treatments to decrease distress and dysfunction, we need to be able to target something that we know what it is. I can't develop a treatment for something I don't know what it is. So if we don't understand all the different biologists that um, are under the symptoms, the differences, whatever you like to call them, of autism, it's very hard to actually change the developmental trajectories, the outcomes of these kids. So that's one thing to keep in mind. The second thing I want you to keep in mind is that Although we now know that a lot of autism lives in our genes, in our genetic material, we are changing a little bit the way about, that we are thinking about how, how these genetics are affecting the symptoms of the behavioral symptoms and the thinking skills and our biologies. So originally, I want you to look at this graph and I'll walk you through it. So here you get the frequency um, of the gene difference. So you can have something that's extremely rare or something very common. And here you get the effect of this gene difference. So it could be something that has a very small effect or it could be something that has a very large effect. So we used to think that autism lived here. We used to think that these traits live in the general population that they all, these genetic differences all have very small effects and that if they got compounded in one person, um, they actually, so this person would actually develop autism. And this may be still true for some people, but in fact for, the, for what we are discovering through the genomics research is that a lot of kids with autism, a lot of people with autism are living up here. So what the, the difference may live in their genetic material but it's a rare difference. It's very few people in the world will have the exact same difference, but this particular difference has a very large effect. Now, why is this important? It's important because for some of us who try to develop effective therapies and we need to understand the biology, it tells us that we're not gonna find a few common genetic differences that we can target but that we are dealing with a whole lot of rare differences that we have to manage. So if you're somebody like me and you're trying to develop treatments for neurodevelopmental disorders, and I tell you right now that we have more than 400 candidate genes 
genetic differences that may be associated with neurodevelopmental disorders, the first thing that you can think about this is that this is an unsolvable problem. Right? If I had to develop a different treatment for every child and there were only two or three kids around the world that had the exact same difference, then I would be in a pretty desperate situation. It turns out, though, that things are a little bit better than that. And the reason they are better is because these genes tend to group together in clusters. So these clusters include a variety of genetic differences that map down to the same brain or metabolic path in our brain. And therefore, this cluster, this metabolic pathway or this brain pathway or this neurological process can be the target for intervention. The other thing that we are learning is that those things are not specific to autism. This goes back to our original point that we almost never find autism in isolation. So we are finding that these genetic differences are actually shared by people who have a variety of neurodevelopmental differences that go from autism to ADHD to intellectual disability to a variety of rare syndromes. A lot of these disorders share their genetic makeup. So if that's the case, then what are we doing just researching autism in isolation? So I was challenged to uh, think a little bit about um, how we think different, about people who think different when it comes to um, researching the biology of these disorders. And so I will argue that there are two places I can take you tonight where we are actually starting to think differently. One place is this um, question that we're asking ourselves about whether autism is actually a distinct biological condition or whether the different neurodevelopmental disorders share their biological risk and therefore by studying those disorders together we learn more about what underlines these differences than if we study these disorders in isolation. And I'll show you some research examples that have already been mentioned actually uh, where we have tried to actually challenge ourselves to think about these biological differences as being at re producing risk for any neurodevelopmental disorder. And the second place I want to take you tonight is to think about how we're changing the way we're thinking about treatment. And I'll show you some examples from medication research where we're trying to translate this understanding from basic gene biology down to treatment all the way to early intervention and technology development. By the way, this is, and I have permission to share this, so this is Liam, this is Phoenix, and this is Gaia. Their mom is in the audience. Phoenix and Liam have autism spectrum disorder, and Gaia has ADHD and a learning disability, and she's gifted. They all share the same genetic makeup, but their presentations look vastly different. Even Liam and Phoenix have very different versions of autism, starting from the same genetic makeup. This is our challenge, right? So if we're gonna be honest with ourselves and ask the important questions, we have to figure out what is that shared biology? Why one child has mild autism, another severe autism, and another ADHD? Why one is anxious and one is not? One, why one has ADHD and one doesn't? All right, so this is our PON network. So um, you heard in the introduction a little bit about PON. PON stands for Province of Ontario Neurodevelopmental Disorders Network. It's a very large investment by the provincial government and the Ontario Brain Institute into neurodevelopmental disorders. It spans Queen's, University of Toronto with both Hall and Blue Review and SickKids, McMaster and Western Universities. And the idea here is we are challenging ourselves to think beyond the diagnostic labels. So we're making the assumption that our diagnostic labels mean nothing, that they do not map onto biology, and that we're just talking about the neurodevelopmental spectrum. So we are recruiting kids who have autism, ADHD, obsessive compulsive disorder, intellectual disability, a variety of rare genetic syndromes that have a variety of developmental presentations all together, and we study them together. We know what they have, 
We know what they would get in a traditional medical setting, but we challenge ourselves to think beyond that. So what we do is we collect information on their genomics and on their behavior and thinking skills and on how the genes speak to their bodies, which is the science of epigenetics. We image their brains to see how, well, how they are structured and how, they are and how they function. We study some other aspects of their bodies, like their immune system. And then we developed a clinical trials network that tests interventions. And we embedded this in this big biomarker core, we call it. So that every child that ends up in a clinical trial to test a new intervention, whether that's a medication, early intervention, technology, you name it, actually has all this information available. So the idea is that by the end of this, we will use this information to create a predictive signature for treatment response. So irrespectively of whether they have autism or ADHD or whatever have you, if they carry this particular signature, they are likely to respond to medication X. Because what we are hoping we're gonna do is we're gonna create groups that share biology irrespectively of what their ultimate, ultimate phenotype looks like, their behavior looks like. Now, this particular grant includes an animal core. Sorry, I, it's actually missing from my slide. Um, so it includes an animal core. And uh, I'll show you a little bit of an example why we bother with mice. It's a very good question why we study mice and how that translates into human kids who have autism. Um, so I'll show you an example of how we're using this. And we're also starting to think about studying very early in development. So if we truly believe that a lot of the autism lives in our genetic code, and we already know and we do know that by the time a child is born, the brain is wired differently, why are we waiting for the diagnosis to be made at the age of three or four, whatever the mean is right now for Ontario, and not don't try to understand the early stages of this and intervene early on. And I'll show you some example of that. I'm gonna skip this. I wanna show you something else that we do different, uh, and that, and we have some of the parent, adv parent advisory board members in the audience, but this particular network includes families and parents and youth with ASD as collaborators in the grant. So the network includes a parent advisory gro group that includes the parents and the kids and the advocacy organizations that are involved in these disorders to help us think together what questions are meaningful, to give us feedback on our progress, and to actually be the messengers, to tell the stories that need to be told, to actually impact policy and um, care in the community. Okay, um, you don't have to look at this slide. I put it uh, there to mostly tell you. I'm gonna show you just a couple of examples of recent wins from this particular strategy. So there is a recent genetic paper that came out of our network. Uh, Dr. Steve Scherer from SickKids is the lead that showed now that using a new technology called exam sequencing gives us a much higher yield in genetic testing compared to the traditionally funded microarray that some of your kids have had. Um, and so this particular publication is now being used as the basis of a negotiation with the government to cover whole exome sequencing for every child with autism in the province. This one I put up there to highlight two things. First, that there is a whole group of young investigators that are getting trained now as part of an initiative like that to become autism clinicians and autism researchers. So Dr. Daniel Baribo is a trainee in psychiatry at the University of Toronto, who's part of POND. And what she showed with our data, with our POND data, and I'm just gonna show you a quick example here. This is a task, we call it reading the mind in the eyes task, where you have to guess what the emotion is from just looking at eyes, not from looking at the whole face. And she showed, as you would expect, that autism is probably performing, kids with autism perform a little bit worse than kids with ADHD and kids with OCD. But the most interesting thing she showed was that kids with ADHD, who by definition should not have social deficits, this is not part of the criteria or the checklist we use for diagnosis for ADHD, have plenty of inability or difficulty detecting emotions. Again, challenging our idea that our diagnostic checklist actually map onto what's really going on 
in the basic abilities of these kids. And then this is uh, Dr. Stephanie Amis, who is a young investigator at CAMH, who took our imaging data to look at how brains are connected. Um, so she looked at how the brains are structurally connected, and she focused on this part of the brain, which is a major bundle that goes from left to right, and it's basically a communication highway from left to right. And she looked at the structural integrity of how well developed this particular bundle was across disorders. And what you'll notice again is there, this uh, AST, ADHD, and OCD groups have a different type of connectivity than the controls, the typically developing kids. And that's significant, so we expect this because they have a neurodevelopmental disorder. But you'll notice there was no difference between the three groups. So we can argue as much as we like about whether the primary diagnosis of a kid was autism or their OCD or their ADHD, but their brains in terms of this communication highway looked quite similar. Not only that, but when she actually looked to see what this correlates with, what does it mean that this particular bundle looks different, the only thing it correlated with was the functional adaptive skills of that person. So whether they had ADHD, ASD, or OCD was almost irrelevant. What it correlated with is with what their adaptive skills were. So again, we're challenging ourselves to rethink this label issue. All right, I promised you one slide on mouse. This is gonna be the slide. I know it looks busy, but I want you to show, <laughs> I wanna show you why we do it, okay? So doctors uh, Jason Lerch and Jacob Elgood up there, this had a very, great idea, and their idea was, what if we put these human genetic differences, these human mutations in mouse, in mice, and then we study the mice. Now they carry the human genetic difference that's associated with autism. So what they did is they took a whole lot of mice that, that had a variety of mutations and genetic differences that are associated with autism, and they imaged them, they put them in the scanner. And they did it the exact same way we put kids in the scanner so that the data is comparable. And so I want you to just focus on this blue chart. So this line means that the brains were the same size as a typically developing mouse, if you like. We call it a wild mouse. And so you'll see, depending on the different mutation, some of these mice had very small brains, some of these mice had very big brains, and everything in between. So just by knowing that this mouse carries an autism mutation did not predict at all what their brain was doing. It could be small, it could be big, or it could be the same size. So if, I, if you can think of this in the human case, that says that if I study a whole bunch of kids with autism in the scanner, and I report to you the mean difference between the kids with autism and the, and the controls, I would tell you there was no difference because the mean would be around here. And I would miss the fact that a whole bunch of kids have very, very small brains, and a whole bunch of kids have very, very big brains, and the biology goes opposite direction, right? So if I try to develop a treatment, and I gave it to all of these kids, if you think in the human case, then if, if, if it was good for these kids, it would be bad for these kids. But I won't know it. So we're using the mouse to try to understand this biological heterogeneity. Now, how are we gonna take it into the human? is a tricky part. So I'll show you uh, how we're thinking of doing it. So what we asked our animal researchers to do is to try to cluster all the human mutations in groups that predict those kids, those kids, and those kids. So what I wanna know is what common mutations cause this, what common mutations cause this, and what common mutations live here. And we are now in the process of taking this cluster into human to validate it, to see if it actually works. Because if it does, then I could use something like a brain marker from an MRI to predict what biology this child may have. So far with me? Good, okay. So um, I'm gonna transition to the treatment part because I'm sure most of us are interested in what it ultimately all means. And so before I tell you what's different, I have to tell you what's now, and for those of you who don't have kids with autism. So what's now is if you come into the psychopharmacology clinic because your child has severe irritability or aggression or anxiety or ADHD symptoms, 
we have not translated this basic genetic information about all the molecular pathways into new medications. So what we do is we borrow from other disorders that have similar symptoms. We hope and pray that the biology looks the same, and then we use these medications. So it is not surprising that sometimes we're very effective and sometimes we completely miss the ball. Um, and so this is where we are starting to think different. So we are saying if we're starting to understand from those genetic variation, for all these genetic 400 genetic differences, if we start understanding those biological pathways, why not just develop drugs or borrow drugs from other disorders that target those pathways? So we're not anymore thinking about, oh, this symptom looks like the symptom in OCD or whatever have you. We're saying, what is the target biological pathway that we want to go after, and do we have a drug for that? And so we have started doing some of this work. Again, I'll show you just a couple of examples. So uh, this is the case where we go after this genomic variation. So we have mapped out a lot of the genetic findings that we have on known metabolic pathways in the brain. This is a synapse with a neuron and a neuron, and a signal um, needs to be transmitted from one neuron to another. And so we're looking for medications that target these pathways. The second thing we do is we're looking at the pathology studies of kids who have passed away from accidental reasons drownings, epilepsy, and so on. Um, and their parents have donated their brains to science. And so we try to see if we find any targets there that could be good candidates for treatment. This is how the whole neuroinflammation story gets started, the inflammation of the brain for autism. And the last thing that we do is we look at circuitries of interest, networks in the brain that we know are important to us, let's say social reward or social motivation, for example. We know what the chemistry of that network is, and then we try to manipulate it. So very quick examples. Memantin is a drug that um, has been approved for the treatment of Alzheimer's. We don't think our kids have Alzheimer's. In fact, we know very well our, the brains of kids with autism do not show signs of dementia as far as we've gone. Um, we haven't really studied the aging process yet. But we know that this particular drug targets one of these receptors that is in the pathway that I showed you before where we have a lot of genetic hits. So the question is, if we use it, can we modify this biology? So this drug has a couple of advantages. We are assuming that the brain in kids with autism is a particularly noisy environment. And we know that because in a lot of these mutations, not only clinically, which a lot of you will tell me, but uh, we know that a lot of these mutations affect the excitement versus calmness balance of the brain. And so we know that this drug will take a very noisy brain, block this particular receptor, and bring the noise down. So far, so good. But if I bring everything down, then uh, there is no information being processed and I haven't gained anything, right? So I would only be interested in this scenario if when I needed the receptor to work, if I needed a lot of excitement for learning, the drug would actually leave the receptor and allow, us, allow for learning to happen, which this drug has been documented to do. So we thought it was a good candidate, and I'm gonna show you very, very quick now, uh, early data. So we were, had two interests in this particular drug. One is, motor praxis, a lot of our kids cannot articulate, they have language up there, they don't have language out here, and they have motor skill deficits everywhere, and cognition. And so you'll see in a randomized controlled trial, half the kids get placebo, half the kids get a real drug, everybody makes gains, so on placebo, from beginning to end, there are gains in both areas, but the kids who were randomized to the drug made much more gain than expected by placebo alone, both in cognition and in motor function. The second one I'll show you very quickly is from the PONT network, so I should highlight that. It's a, a drug that's approved for ALS, but again, functions in the same space that we're interested in. It has effects in this calmness to excitation um, balance in the brain, and it works for those of you who care in the presynaptic and postsynaptic space. And so we thought it was a good candidate of a drug, and we looked at the types of behaviors that get in the way of quality of life and adaptive functioning and integration, integration which is usually externalizing and internalizing symptoms such as aggression, irritability, hyperactivity, and anxiety. And you'll see again pre and post here, 
that in the placebo we get actually not much response on this drug, but on the drug we get a 30% reduction in irritability, a 25% reduction in hyperactivity, and in the case of anxiety we get another 30% reduction. So we know, we're starting to learn that this translational approach may actually be working. Now, sometimes we're learning that some things don't work, and that's important too, right? So we, from neuropathology, we have a neuroinflammation target. We thought the easiest way to go after it in the very young kids is to give very high doses of omega-3 fatty acids. We ran a randomized control trial, it did nothing. So we can tell parents they're free to use omega-3 fatty acids, but in our hands, there is no enhancement of learning with omega-3 fatty acids in toddlers. Now, thinking differently. The other question we asked ourselves is, is there something that's happening in the rest of medicine that could be lessons learned for us? And oncology, cancer research, has been a good place to look for lessons learned. So in, this is an example from lung cancer. So the, this particular drug was in trials in humans, and it had about a 10% response rate. But by all, by all account, it should work. Like it was targeting biology of interest, it should have worked better than 10%. So what the researchers did is they took the mutations from the cancer, put them in the mouse, like we've done with the imaging study, and then treated those mice, and realized that although it's all lung cancer, the types of cancers that carried those types of mutations had a 100% response rate, where the types of cancers that had this type of mutation had a 0% response rate. So they called this a co-clinical trial because they ran the trials in mice and humans at the same time to try to understand this kind of discrepancy between what you expect and what you get. So you should know that we actually leveraged PON to get a very large grant now from Brain Canada to actually run co-clinical trials in um, autism. The first trial is running right now, so I don't have results for you, but uh, in terms of thinking differently, that's one other place we're going. I'm going to skip this. I'm going to tell you there's a lot of work on autism technologies. I'm not going to spend a lot of time unless you have questions later, but we're working on anxiety meters to help the kids um, detect their anxiety before they actually feel it by using a color scale. We're using a social coaches uh, using the Google Glass and so on. So a lot of work in this area. Very early intervention. So Mike made the point about early intervention and how important it is, but again, Early intervention traditionally is given after diagnosis. We know the brains are affected before diagnosis. So why not get there at the first signs that there is some kind of neurodevelopmental difference? And this is what Dr. Jessica Bryan's program does with the social ABCs, which is a new program that targets the early red flags in babies and young toddlers with ASD. There was a randomized control trial that has, is now in the process of, um, it has been accepted for publication and it's going to be out soon, to show that if you use this type of curriculum, you get improvements in the 12-month-olds. We're not talking three-year-olds, four-year-olds. We're talking 12-month-olds in social responsiveness and initiation. They also learned that the parents are actually very good at this. So the major pushback was that parents are not therapists and we cannot be training parents to do that. Our response was we need to think differently about this. A 12-month-old doesn't spend time in school. A 12-month-old spends time with their parents. So their therapeutic environment is their parent environment and can we actually train parents? And it turns out parents are very good at this. They, this is fidelity, so over the period of the treatment, they got much better at providing this particular treatment, and when we walked out and we left them on their own devices, they maintained their skills. So again, thinking different about how we can get in there early. Um, I should mention that because we're in Ontario, so that you may know that the Ontario government has now four pilot programs for very early intervention, so intervention after the first red flags, and social ABCs is one of these programs, but it's gonna get piloted in the next two years, so stay tuned. Last thing I'm gonna say uh, on research is this. This is the map of the subway in Seoul, in South Korea, which is notorious apparently. It takes you two and a half hours to get from one side of the city to another side of the city. Um, so just because we know the facts doesn't mean that we can actually translate them into treatments, into policy and everyday care. And sometimes what we need to know to make that translation goes beyond the science and it has to do with what it will cost us, cost us and what the responsibilities are. 
and we're doing quite a bit of work in actually showing, providing the data to show what the gains financially are by improving effectiveness. I know I'm out of time, so I'm not gonna show you all the details on this one, although it was a fun slide. And I'm gonna show you one more thing. So I, thought, I, I, I hope I gave you a little bit of a feeling of how we're starting to think differently in the way we do research in neurodevelopmental disorders and specifically in autism. But ultimately, we need to be studying the right thing. And the right thing is the thing that matters to families and people who have autism. So we in Ontario Brain Institute and Pond have partnered up and we are starting a large initiative that um, uses a standardized process, process uh, developed by the James Lynn Alliance, JLA, um, that asks the stakeholders, so the people who are affected, their families, their caregivers, their neighbors, their friends, um, what's important to study as an outcome in research, what's important to study as an end goal for research. So I want you to stay tuned. We don't have RIB, we don't have ethics approval to show you all the materials today. We tried, but we couldn't get it. Um, but if you stay tuned, we will ask you to go in and do the survey and tell us exactly what you think should be studied as a treatment target in our population. And I'm going to stop here.